we're gonna go ahead and do the next segment on this one Pandolfini's in-game course one of my all-time favorites I don't want to do a hatchet job on it and butcher it so I'm gonna go ahead and just go right from the beginning the way that Bruce Pandolfini has it laid out and the way that he teaches it or the way that he recommends teaching it and you see what you think we'll take a look at that one the next one that we're going to take a look at is from this book it's the encyclopedia of chess endings it is diagram 1787 and the analysis is from Bell Labs it's, this is the analysis that was done with uh, I believe table bases and it was done on a computer it's not done by a human This is the way the computer played the best moves for both sides. Did anybody notice how that white was using the bishop and knights first? You may not have understood that last move where the knight goes to here, but you will understand it in a couple more moves when the knight is going to start working its way over. Another waiting move. Another waiting move. I think we've seen this earlier in another one. I think we covered this one already.
and there's the mate. There is one variation in here where the black tries to branch off. I hope we can get it before we run out of time on our disc. If not, I'll have to change the disc or get another disc and we'll cover it. It's too important to miss. Okay, we have one more variation to cover. And this is the same one from the ECE Encyclopedia of Chess Endings. But this time there's the variation. We've already done this. First waiting move. Another waiting move. And this is where the variation comes in. The last time on the main line, he went that way. Now, if he tries to run back to the wrong corner,
and that's it. That one was a total of 28 moves. If black goes the wrong way with it, messes up, it could take 28 moves or it took 31 moves. And that's where the computer playing both sides with best defense, they only lasted 31 moves. That's it, they were done dead. <laughs> King, King didn't last. King was a goner. So we'll start this one now. Candlefini's in-game course. We'll set up the position. This is Maiden 2. A Bishop Knight mate can be forced only in a corner guarded by the Bishop. The two minor pieces share responsibilities. If the Bishop moves on dark squares, the Knight should guard light squares. Here the Bishop flushes out the King and the Knight confers the Coup de Gras. It's pronounced Coup de Gras, not Coup de Grace. Flushes out the king, and then the checkmate. Now for a mate in three. In this scenario, the knight sets up the death blow and the bishop deals it. The three pieces line up chorus line fashion in the end. Though the bishop could be equally ruthless on B2. Okay, this is a mate in three. The next part, in this scenario, the knight sets up the death blow and the bishop deals it. The three pieces line up chorus line fashion in the end, though the bishop could be equally ruthless on b2, c3, d4, or E5. Meanwhile, the light squares are held by the tandem king and knight. Actually, that king's supposed to be right there. This is a typo in the diagram. You can see. First one right here. King goes down, goes up, only one spot to go, and right there, mate. That was in game 17 in Pandolfini's in game course. Now we'll go to in game 18. The first one we did, the mate in two, was in game 16. Now we'll set up the next position. This position comes from inching Black's King step by step from A8 over here to H8. On the previous move, the bishop checked the king at f8, forcing it to g8. The next square white must control is g8. 
White's got to control that square by mobilizing the knight, but the knight must not block the bishop's diagonal. Also, White must avoid giving stalemate, which would happen if he attacked what square? Pop quiz. If you said G8, you got it correct. Which would happen if he attacked G8 while Black's king was still on H8. Everything clicks thanks to a temporizing bishop shift along what diagonal? Got it? If you said this diagonal, A3 to E7, you got it correct. To quote Pandolfini, according to Pandolfini's Endgame course, everything clicks, comma, thanks to a temporizing bishop shift along the A3, E7 diagonal. Now, granted, it's actually A3 to F8, but the part of that the part of the diagonal that they're going to use is this e7 part. Okay, first move. That's the tempo waiting move. Brings it over here, puts him in check. In game 19, another mate in four. We'll set up the position. Black's king is about to depart g8, leaving the way open for white's king to enter f7. This means that the knight can relinquish its coverage of what square? If you said g6, you got it right. Relinquish its coverage of g6 and reposition to control what square? going to give up that square right there and reposition itself to control a certain square. What square is it? Take a second. Think about it. This means that the knight can relinquish its coverage of G6 and reposition to control H7. Starting from E5, the knight has three equally good ways to begin deployment. What are those three ways? Take a guess. Knight d7, knight f3, and one more. If you said knight g4, you're right. Correct. Okay, we'll take a look at this. It's this one. Looks like the king's getting away. Not really. Bishop's got that and that. That's his only square he can go to right now. And that's about to be sealed. Because now the king's got that. The bishop's got that. He's going to go right back in the corner. Because the king's got that. Mate. We'll rack them up again.
That's version A. This is version B. There you go. We'll take a look at a third mate and four. Puzzle in game 20 or puzzle 20. This one is a typo in the book. I'll show you the position. Now in the book it says, on the back row, Black's King has a mere two squares, G8, we know that's typo, because the king is sitting on H7, the knight, see if you can see this or not, see this knight right here, this knight has that square covered, so I crossed it out and put H7, there's only the two squares they've got, the knight's got that, and they should have that right there. Yeah. They would have these two squares they could mess with. It says also refuge at G7. On the back row, Black's King has a mere two squares, H7 and H8 to play with, but there's also refuge at G7. White sniffs the danger and moves in with his own king. Well, cross that out if you got that book. He's only got these two squares, H7 and H8. That's it. The refuge at G7. So we'll start it. First move, seal off this square here. So he's only got these two squares left. King's only got one place to go. Bring him back. Has to go back. Mate. We'll take a look at that again. Notice how he uses the knight to bring him right back. Gets a waiting move. I call that a waiting move by using that knight. See that? First thing he does, comes to here, cuts off the refuge square, has to go here, you say, well, why couldn't he just do this? Well, because if he did that, he'd be like that and they'd be stuck. There's no move to go anywhere. Then you'd be going right back to square one like this so you have to do this first brings them to here then you do two things with this move number one you get the king in position and number two you cut off that square that flight square so now when you take the bishop and you for any little kids out there watching this when you take the bishop now and you put him in check, he can't run, see? Can't go there because the knight, this little knight, has got that square. 
That's a, maybe one of the tricky ones for the little kids out there watching. That's Endgame 20 in the book called Pandolfini's Endgame Course by Bruce Pandolfini. Now, the next four are what I call the heart and soul of this uh, Bishop Knight checkmate. These are the keys, the three parts. They are the lock, the king shift, and the drive. And then there's a tweener, there's an in-betweener move or technique called transition to the lock. We'll be covering that. The first one is the lock. Let's go ahead and get started. We'll set up the position. Even without the presence of White's King, Black's King is trapped in a Bishop Knight net. Only six unguarded squares lie within the cordon. Uh, within that little net, that little box, that little area, whichever is easier for you to figure it out. What are the six squares? Only six unguarded squares. Anybody see him? White's plan is so simple. The king is maneuvered from the queen side, usurping, meaning taking away, e8 and f8, until the bishop can transfer safely to the f8 to h6 diagonal, along this little diagonal here. Should have done it more like this so you can see it better. Okay, first move. You want to start walking them. Bring your king this way first because you want to start walking them that way. Your knight has that. Let me get this arm out of the way. The knight, for white, your knight has that and that. Your bishop has that. Okay? Those six squares were E8, F8, G8, and H8. G7 and H7. Those were the six squares. That's it. So the first move goes like this because your knight has here and here, your bishop has here. Or for the little kids watching, the knight has this one, bishop's got that one, knight's got that one. King is going this way to box them in. You gotta start going this way with your king so you can start to move this diagonal off, you can move this bishop off that diagonal. That way, when you start moving your king across, the king has to go in the corner. There's another waiting move.
There's your cutoff move right there, cutting off that square, the flight square. I think everybody can see what's about to happen. Did you get that? Okay, we'll do it one more time through. Here's a key move, it's right there, so you can be in position to go right there to help deliver a checkmate. There's your cutoff. That's called the lock. Now we're going to look at the transition to the lock. We'll set up the position. Okay, puzzle 22. In game 22. To seal the door, White's knight must be at what square, and his bishop at what other square? Take a second, look it over. To seal the door, White's knight must be at what square and his bishop at the other square? What are the two squares? Square for the knight. If you said this square, you got it right. The square is e5. And the bishop has to be at g5 to seal the door. See, because here, if you had that, that's like a doorway the king can get out. Now he can't get out. Because you got bishop, bishop, and knight. You got king, king, king. Well, not yet, but you got here and here, you got king. Bishop would have that. So you effectively would seal the door because even though your king is not here blocking that, your king is blocking that square and that square. He tries to go the long way around, your bishop has that square. So all of this. That's all sealed off. And of course he wouldn't be able to go there. Maybe be able to go right there. That's about it. Because now, with your bishop right there, you'd have that and that. But you'd have this one and this one with the knight. That's the key. I hope everybody saw that. To seal the door, White's knight must be at e5 and his bishop at g5. The king then ankles in from the flank. The antique move here used to be bishop d4, expropriating the a1, h8 diagonal. Yeah, we all got all that, huh? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, right, expropriating what? Dude, plain English. What it, what it means is the old way of doing it used to be to bring your bishop to right here and take this diagonal from here to here. Take that long square, this long diagonal, dark square diagonal, or what they call the long dark square diagonal. There's only one. 
This is your long light square diagonal from here all the way to here. This is called typically called the dark square diagonal or the long dark square diagonal because it's the longest one with the dark squares. See? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Difference. Expropriating uh, basically just means taking over or capturing it, taking it, keeping it. But stronger is bishop to g5. Instead of doing this, the old way of doing it, a stronger move would be here because you'd keep that and that at the same time. The old school, old way of doing it, old school way was to go here, just concentrate on that one first. You got your knight here and your bishop here and we'll worry about it later. The newer way of doing it is like that. Bishop to g5 followed by the knight to e5 creating a lock. That's why it's called the transition to the lock. Okay? Depending on black's defense, he is mated either at h7 by the knight or at h8 by the bishop. After three moves, the position transforms into endgame 21. Mate is forced in nine moves. So your first move, right here, that's the first move. Ah, wouldn't that be stalemate? I think not. If you're just seeing here and here going sideways, see, that's not stalemate. It's like that. There's still a square they can go to. Now, you bring it over to here. Because the bishop's got that. King's got that. So he can't go anywhere near that knight. And the knight has that flight square. And just like so, like we did before. One more time for those that didn't quite catch it. You go here, go like that, use a waiting move, and you also use a, what I call a cutoff. You cut off the squares. By doing that, that's really about the only way you can do it. Because problem is, you need to get to e5 with that knight. So if you go this way and this way, it's not going to work. Not in the same number of moves. It won't work that way. So you do this first. Go to here. Cut off here. So there's no escape. Bring this here, cut off that square where he has to go back. Now you could bring the knight to e5 in the minimum number of moves and still force the king onto that specific square. And he's trying to go the other way. Why is he not just going like this? Uh, because number one, that's the right square for this bishop. It's the right color square. So when you're the defender in this case, you're trying to go back. You're not trying to go like this. Uh, you're trying to go back. You're trying to stay as far away from that corner as you can. So that's what Black's trying to do. Stay as far away from that corner as he can so he doesn't get checkmated. But it's not going to work. It doesn't do him any good. And then we start the lock. Yeah. Yeah. 
do that with the bishop, cuts off that square, and then you just swap it out, switch it out, what we call a switch up. Switch it up, bring it back to here, your knight still has that, your bishop's got that. He could try to make your life difficult, that's fine, doesn't matter, we've got waiting moves to take care of that. So now, he's only got here or here. That's it. And we just covered that on the last one, on the lock. Okay, and we just covered that. So he goes to here, tries to make a run for it, doesn't do any good, boxed in. Fate is sealed. And mate. Now, you've seen the lock and the transition to the lock. Here's the key part on the transition to the lock. Right here. This is your transition. All right there. Now we're going to go to the king shift. We'll set up the position. If black starts, well, if black's king starts in a corner of opposite color to the bishop, it must be systematically driven across the board to a corner of the same color. Thus, if in a light corner, like this king over in here, in a light corner, the king must be forced to a dark one. if that's the color traveled by the bishop. All three pieces, meanwhile, must integrate their unique powers to form a united force. Here, white's king occupies d6. Why? Pop quiz. Why is white's king going to occupy d6? The answer, to support the knights reaching e7, where it seals off what square? It's going to go to e7 right here and seal off what square? If you said c8, you're right. Because remember, the defender, in this case black, is going to keep trying to go to the wrong corner. So by getting a knight up to here, it's going to seal off that square, forcing the king that way. Seals off c8. Uh, here white's king occupies d6 to support the knights reaching e7, where it seals off c8 and guards potential escape squares at f5 and g6. See here, here, and here. Potential escape squares. 
anything that's a potential escape is good for black because black's just trying to avoid being checkmated. So you cut off that square and here two flight squares. The bishop then skims to e3 controlling g5 and leading to the previous net. In the final position white quickly reaches the winning lock. Final position, four moves. What are they? Take your time, think about it. No hurry. Four moves for each side. Here's the four moves. Number one, right there. Number two, cut off those two squares. Now you cut off that, so you got knight, knight, bishop, starting to get them boxed in. Has to go back because there's nowhere else to go. And then you go to right there. Then they go back. And then we start the transition to the lock. That's the king shift in game 23 and we don't need to go all the way through it. We have done went through it several times. I think we've all got it. The next part is called the drive. This is a key part in making this bishop knight checkmate work. You're going to have to find a way to drive the king to the edge of the board and then drive him over to the other corner. Uh, also what I call drive him out of the corner, out of the wrong corner. Here's the reason why. We'll set up the position. Now, when Black's King is entrenched in the wrong corner of the board, which is a corner that is not accessible to White's Bishop. That's what it says in parenthesis. A corner that is not accessible to White's Bishop. I don't know if he even has that back here in the uh, glossary. He might. Nope. It just says wrong bishop. But anyway, I think you got the idea. For any kids out there watching this, that's it. There's your definition. When Black's King is entrenched in the wrong corner of the board, which is a corner that is not accessible to White's Bishop, White's Bishop can't get him. And this corner can't get him. He's on dark squares. It can be driven to either opposite corner. Either A1, you can drive them this way along the edge of the board, or you could drive them this way. Either one. And we've seen in earlier segments, we've seen where white drives the king down along the edge, along that file. It all begins with a knight check. Right there. All begins with that. To force the king to h8 or 
B6, knight to B6 for a parallel attack toward A1. Example would be if you went like that. They'd have to go that way. And then you could do something with your bishop because they can't go back this way. They'd have to go that way. And then you could just start walking your king and using your bishop and knight together and just on down that way. But we're going to go up this way. We're going to just see the example from the book. For consistency with previous end games, the h8 drive is shown, but a mirror image attack ending on a1 works just as well. Whatever the approach, it is accomplished step by step, controlling in sequence one square after the other along the outside row. The knight hits the light squares the bishop attacks the dark squares, and the king performs the multiple functions. What are those multiple functions? Performs the multiple functions protecting the knight while confining the enemy king. Tempo moves as required are left to the bishop, a straight line piece which acts how? Pop quiz. How? Which acts at a distance. After this, now comes your tempo move. Right there, bishop to b6. It's tempo. Now I can't go back. Your knight had that keeping him out of the corner. Can't go back once you put that bishop there. Has to go over. And this is what I call the W to the other side. It's going to make that W pattern. Anybody see that? Kind of, kind of like a W, you can go back up, but come up like this, so it's a little different, it's not quite exactly a W, <laughs> no, not, not exactly, okay, knight to D5, King E8. White wins as in the previous endgame. And there you have it. And that's everything, probably the most comprehensive that we've done or the most comprehensive video out there 
on Bishop Knight Checkmate. A lot of little tips and little secrets there on doing the Bishop Knight Checkmate. I hope everybody's enjoyed it. It's been a very long video. We've had to stop the filming, take a break, come back, film some more, take a break, come back, film some more, just keep taking breaks. And that's why it may look like that uh, the video looks like somebody's kind of moved around. Well, that's because somebody has moved around. I've had to take breaks and film it over a period of time, not just all continuous. But thanks for watching, and I hope that you enjoyed the video from PC Chess Club. And you can like us on Facebook. That's PC, letter P, letter C, dot chess, dot club. And if you're watching this video, you probably will see something in the title about PC Chess Club. But you can email us, PCChessClub at yahoo.com. On YouTube, most of the videos will be on Chess Coach Trainer. That's the channel. Or PC Chess Club. And on Facebook, it'll be Chess Trainers 365 or PC Chess Club. On Facebook, it's going to be PC.Chess.Club. But thanks for watching, and we look forward to doing a lot more videos for you. Have a great day.